You ready to get in the Word tonight? All right. Well, we're going to pick up where we left off last week. Uh, churches, pastors, and people, how to advance the kingdom and find your place in the body of Christ. And we're going to just slow down and take the next several weeks and just camp out here for a while. And every one of these, we're, you'll, you said, well, I didn't come last, last Wednesday. Can I still get something? Yes, we're teaching the Word. The Word is anointed. All right, you can pick it up. This is not algebra. If you didn't get chapter 1, you can still get chapter 2, praise God. And unlike algebra, you will actually use this stuff in your life. And if there's any algebra teachers in here, I love you and I bless you in Jesus' name. But I have not yet used algebra in my adult life. As a matter of fact, <laughs> if you would have told me I would use Greek and Hebrew more than I used algebra, I would have laughed at you when I was 16, but that is the case. Well, last week in here, I showed you a graph, if anybody remembers, and it shows the church attendance in the United States and church membership has declined by 23% over the last 20 years. Well, there it is right there. And we were just kind of talking about that and saying, you know, what's, what's going on here? And, you know, if you would have taken the survey of that graph in late 2001, it'd probably been up to 80% because that's after 9-11. Do you remember 9-11? Everybody came to church. And... Uh, but something's happened these last 20 years <laughs> where for the first time since we've recorded these surveys, which is almost 100 years, that church attendance in our country has dipped below 50%. That's kind of odd. And so we got to ask ourselves, what's going on here? All right, what, 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 what's the deal? And I know some people want to blame politics. We talked about this last week. Um, in those 20 years, we've had 12 years of Republicans in office and the president and eight years of Democrats. So you can't say, well, it's this political party or that political party. You know, it's not all Hillary Clinton's fault. It's not all Donald Trump's fault. This is not, the, this is not their fault. Um, so what we're trying to figure out what's going on. And let's remember the source of power for the church is the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. That is where we get our power from. So as we're going through this series, Churches, Pastors, and People, we want to find out what the Word says, and we want to find out what the Holy Spirit is leading us to and empowering us in to be the church of Jesus Christ, because there's going to be a great awakening in the United States. There is going to be a third great awakening, and we are going to be a part of it. It's going to be an awakening that shakes the entire world, and we're going to see countries go in the process of 10 years from being 97% Muslim to 90%, 97% Christian, 97% Hindu, going to be 97% Christian, and you can put that in your revival pipe and smoke it. Amen. Amen. We are going to see a great awakening in our lifetime. I refuse to settle for anything less, and unlike a lot of Christians, I'll put my life on the line for it. Amen. Will you? Amen. I remember preaching a message in Bible college. We had student chapels twi twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And you had, I mean, it was something if you got picked to do a student chapel. I mean, you were, the, this was like your day to shine. And I remember I got picked, bless God. I was so excited. And can you imagine me being excited to preach? And I remember that day, and they had, they had row ch tables set up with chairs behind them. And by the time it was all said and done, I had jumped up on those tables, and I was running across those tables. And I preached a message, give me revival or give me death. And I am here today to tell you, I believe in that message, give me revival or give me death. Amen. 
Well, say, do you have a death wish? No. But I don't want to live without the presence of God. Amen. Our ultimate goal, though, through this series, is to help you find your place in the body of Christ and effectively live in that place with passion and confidence. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, he asked them, who do you say that I am and to the disciples? Remember that question? I asked it on Sunday morning. Who do you say that I am? They said, some John the Baptist, some you know, Elijah, some one of the prophets. But who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. And on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to build his church. The news can say whatever they want to say. Politicians can say whatever they want to say. Does anybody see that video that happened just recently with that pastor in Canada? And, and the uh, people, the police came to try to shut him down. And he ran the cops out. And he said, you get out of here. I'm telling you what, yes. Yes and amen. This is the house of God. Amen. This is the house of God. Amen. The authority of the state stops at that driveway out there. Amen. There's a, you step onto our asphalt, this is, this is God's property. Amen. Jesus said, I'll build my church, and the gate to hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. 1 Kings chapter 8, you don't have to turn that way, I have time tonight. But I want you to reference this, and, and just write this down. 1 Kings chapter 8 the glory of the Lord is poured out on the church. Solomon's temple, the temple that Solomon built, they're getting ready to dedicate it. They, David spent years raising the money to build it. David said, God, let me build this temple. And God said, no. Sometimes God tells you no. God tells you yes to everything you think. You're not serving God. You're serving a deified version of yourself. Amen. The no. Solomon built it. And when Solomon gets the temple done, and he has all this dedication ceremony going on, it is one of the most wonderful depictions of God meeting people and people meeting God in the entire Bible until we get to heaven. And the Bible tells us that the glory of God was so thick in the temple that the priests could not stand. They were so encompassed with the glory of God, they could no longer minister. Would you, I mean, I know that sometimes we enjoy good preaching, good ministry, but wouldn't you just like to come to church and Pastor Matt can't preach no more because the glory of God is in the house. Amen. So the priests can't minister because the glory is so prevalent. They're, all the people of Israel came. They're gathered there, and they're in the presence of the Lord. They're feasting. They're singing. As a matter of fact, when you read the depiction of what God requires musically to be in his temple, it's absolutely amazing. I mean, people, do we have to have all that music? Yes! Yes! We do! Well, I don't like music. Stay out of heaven. <laughs> it's not going to be for you. Well, I don't think you're going to like the music in hell much better. They have rap music down there. <laughs> Country western, too. <laughs> oh, my. I'm teasing. <laughs> offerings. That, oh, they, they gave these amazing offerings to the Lord. And Solomon stood up, and the priests stood when they could, and they blessed the people. And I want you to think... Put it asterisk here. This is an Old Testament church. 
The glory of God is so thick they cannot stand. The blessing of God going out, feasting, fellowshipping, coming together, ministering, worshiping, music. The asterisk says, that's the Old Testament. They didn't even have the infilling of the Holy Spirit yet. They were on that side of the Calvary. We're on this side of Calvary. If anybody, anywhere, when we come together as the church, we ought to be expecting the glory of God to fall in this place. We ought to be expecting the power of God to minister to us, praise God. Amen. I'm telling you what, I don't know about you, but I, I, I think we set the bar too low. Anyway, well, you know, we're going to church. I'm not just going to church. I'm going to meet Jehovah God, Jehovah Rapha, my healer. I'm going to meet Jehovah Nissi, my banner of victory. I'm here. I'm coming to meet Jehovah Shalom, my peace. Jehovah Sidkenu, my righteousness. Jehovah Rohi, my shepherd. Hallelujah. I'm here to meet with God. I like all y'all too, but I'm here to meet with God. And we come to meet each other, and, and there's going to be fellowship and blessing, and the glory of God is there. I'm not just going, oh my, you know, God loves church. He, he rebukes those people in the Old Testament, Isaiah 58. It's where he says, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. He says, hey. You guys, quit doing your own thing on the holy day. That's what he says. Get back to church. Amen. We don't. We, 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 he's, he's, he's God. The Bible says God is a jealous God. Amen. He wants us here. He wants to pour himself out on us. He wants to have the kids over on Christmas and the kids over on Easter. But he wants to have the kids over once a week for Sunday dinner. Amen. So, just as we look at God's plan for the church, it's, it's not merely a physical building. It's, it's the ecclesia. It's the called out ones. But people, a lot of people say, like to say, well, I'm the church. And yes, you are the church, but by yourself, you ain't. You're the church when you are the church. But when you're alone, you you alone. Called out ones. That is plural. Amen. Two kinds of church. Universal. Jesus is the head. Local. Pastor is the under shepherd. Last week we started 13 things about God's church. Number one, he's going to build it. If, 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 if Jesus is going to build the church, why would anybody want to put the brakes on that? For God so loved the world that he did not send a committee. Amen. Have y'all ever seen the church bus model? It's got five steering wheels, ten brakes, pedals, and no accelerator. <laughs> for God so loved the world, he did not send a committee. You can say thank you, Jesus, for that. He said, I'm going to build the church. Why would we want to resist the building of the church? Number two, Christ is the foundation. There's no other foundation than that which is already laid, that which is Jesus Christ. Everything we do is built on Jesus. Number three, the devil cannot prevail against it. Man, you want to have some joy this next few months? Can I just tell you how to drink some new wine? Turn off your television. Turn off the news. Get out of Facebook and start reading the Word of God. You're going to have, you'll, you'll have so much joy, no one's going to know what to do with you. Amen. Just, just remove the negativity from your life. Remove all that junk, the drama, the fear monger. You don't, you need the word of God. Drink the new wine, baby. I like what Tim Grisham does. He, he brings the Bible and says, hey, I got some new wine for you. And it, right there. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I feel pretty good about that. Amen. How many of y'all feel like you're starting to take a drink tonight? Amen. Amen. He's adding to it daily, number four. Number five, he has established leadership in the church. Number six, new stuff tonight. And we're going to read a lot out of Ephesians. If you want to turn to chapter five, that will be where we stay the rest of the night. Ephesians chapter five. I love the word of God.
And uh, we're going to pick it up right around verse 23. Uh, verse 22. And this is actually the scripture I use when I'm doing a, me- a wedding. Do you and do you. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the, of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church, gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Go down to verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So we're going to just dissect that passage for our next few points tonight. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Amen. The church is subject to Jesus Christ. He is the boss. Most people don't have a problem with that. He's the head of the universal church, and he's the head of the local church. And when we understand that, and when we understand John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, it's important we understand if we're going to be subject to Christ, we've got to be subject to the Word of God. So if it says it in the Word, we do it, that settles it. If it says don't do this, we don't do it. If it says do do this, we do do that. And the other thing we have to have enough common sense is we've got to study the Bible. Because there are some things that might mean one thing in English, in our culture, they mean something different in another culture. Like when the Bible, I mean, one you all know real well, but we taught it many times, is when the Bible speaks about an evil eye. It's not talking about going like this. You know, it's talking about the level of our generosity or being stingy. If you have a good eye, you're a generous person. If you have a bad eye or an evil eye, you're stingy. That's what the Bible talks about, an evil eye. So we have to put it in context. We have to put it in that language before we establish doctrine. But once we establish doctrine, then bless God, what it says we do. Amen. The rules of man won't work. The Pharisees, they took the word of God and they added to it. They added 400, more than 400 additional laws called fence laws. If God said, don't do this, and here was the standard God said, the Pharisees would add laws outside of that so that people wouldn't come close to this. But what happened was people began to serve the laws of man. They lost their power because of the tradition of men, and they lost the meaning of what God originally said. Pharisees made made living for God difficult. They added their own sets of rules. Well, we don't want to add to what God said. How many of y'all know there's days it's hard enough to be a Christian? Like when you're trying to get somewhere and there's slow moving traffic in front of you. The ideas of man won't work. King David, because of the foolishness of King Saul before him, the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the very presence of God, was stolen from Israel when the Philistines ended up with it. Then every time they tried to do something with it, they got in trouble and they found they put it next to their god Dagon. The next day Dagon would fall over, they would prop Dagon back up, Dagon would fall over. It was a Dagon day. So they finally said, we don't know what to do. So the, literally the Philistines just hooked, hooked the Ark of the Covenant up to a couple horses, that slapped the horses on the back, said, here you go. And David said, you know, I've got this idea. We ought to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Israel. And so now this one of those things, we've got to do what God says. God set very specific standards for how the Ark of the Covenant was to travel. And only priests who were ordained, could carry the Ark of the Covenant. 
That's why you got to be careful when someone says, well, I don't need the church. I, we, I, I'm the church, and we can have church at home. Bless the Lord. You ain't, if you ain't a pastor, you ain't a prophet, you ain't an evangelist, you ain't a teacher, you ain't, you ain't an apostle, then you ain't the church by yourself. There are some things that God has ordained to carry the gospel. We're all ordained to carry the gospel, but there is an order to the church. Amen. We talked about that last week. And only the priests were allowed to carry it. They had to carry it using a certain type of pole, affixed a certain type of way. There was a, a certain type of order that they were to walk in. Well, David had a better idea than God. He said, instead of using that old-fashioned method, let's have a new cart. Because my labor costs are getting kind of high. We can put this thing on wheels, have some donkeys carry it. Donkeys are cheaper than priests. They don't eat as much. They, they, they don't. <laughs> You'll get that tomorrow. <laughs> donkeys are cheaper than priests. They don't talk back. They don't get tired as much. We're just going to carry this thing using some oxen. Actually, it's oxen, not donkeys. We're going we're to attach this thing to some oxen and just keep on going. Well, as they were going, one of the oxen stumbled, and the cart began to almost tip. And a man who was there walking along put his hand on the ark to try to stable it to keep it from falling, and that man was struck down dead. God don't need no help. And David was upset. The Bible said David was angry. What are you doing? But you see, God is not going to honor a method or anything outside of his word. He is not going to do it. And sometimes we get these new ideas as a church that, to, that are contrary to some of the things God has called us to do and to be, all right? And I would say be careful of some new ideas. Yes, can our music style change? Sure, but the message cannot. There's another thing. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, it is by the foolishness of preaching that people shall hear the gospel. Now, we can use a play to preach the gospel. We can use a microphone to preach the gospel. We, we can use a megaphone. We can stand up on a chair and preach the gospel. But at some point, we have to open our mouth and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, there, there is something that is birthed out of the pit of hell. Oh, you want to know why? One of the greatest reasons over the last 20 years you've seen the church decline is called the seeker-sensitive movement. And I can show you thousands of churches that were powerful and packed, and you had, you, you had to stand in line to get in, and they get a new pastor who's got a new idea, and he says, we're going to just not be so hard with the gospel. We're not going to preach against sin like we used to. We're going to make it comfortable for people. We're, gonna, we just, we're, not, we're just going to kind of assimilate them. Let me tell you something, sugar. You need the gospel. You are a sinner. You're going to go to hell if you don't repent of your sin and you will die a death 10,000 times a day and you will ask for deliverance and there will be none. And it is only by the power of the cross of Jesus Christ that you shall be saved. And without that power of the cross in your life, you are damned for eternity. Put that in your secret sensitive pipe and smoke it. Amen. That is one of the greatest betrayals of the faith of our generation. That is the new cart of our generation, the secret sensitive movement. I am not going to allow you to be comfortable in your sin or a half-hearted, lukewarm commitment to Jesus Christ because I don't want you to get before him and then all of a sudden you realize you're Jesus vomit. Because Jesus vomit don't make it to heaven. Love you. Amen. That's a good preacher, preacher, Pastor. I thought that, you know. Now, the other thing I want you to get is if Jesus is the head of the church, let me put it to you another way. He's the boss. Y'all ever notice when 
And, and I know this is human nature, man. It just is. But you're at work, and you're just kind of doing your thing, and you're working at a certain pace, and maybe you're 80% in, 70% focused, and then the boss comes by. Get a little more alert, get a little more focused. Maybe you go from, and you're good people, you're at 92%. You go from 92 to 105, right? But the boss showed up. That's the authority. They can hire, they can fire, they can give you a raise. Can I, can I tell you, listen, we have a lot of clear scripture. Ladies and gentlemen, I love you. Let me help you understand. Jesus is building the church. Jesus loved the church. But Jesus is ahead of the church, and he's going to demand an account of our lives in the church. He's the boss. And the problem with Jesus being the boss, not only is he always here, the Holy Ghost is always here. And so the boss is always watching. Have y'all ever have some, some people you have where you work, there's a security camera right over your desk or right over where you, and you all feel like, you know, the man is always watching me. Let me tell you something. The Holy Ghost is always watching you. <laughs> he's just, and, and I'm not saying he's watching you to wait for you to mess up so he can torment you. But at the same time, we have to understand we're going to give an account to Jesus for our lives. And when we read Matthew chapter 25, I mean, that's one of the most scathing chapters of the New Testament. And Jesus gives us the parable of the talents. And he tells us about there was, there was a boss. And the boss in the parable is him. And he says, he has three servants. And these servants have differing degrees of, of ability that he's given them a monetary value to. And it's called talents. One was given one, one was given two, one was given five. The master goes on a long journey. He comes back and he demands an account. Tell me what you did with what I gave you. The first servant says, you gave me five. I made five. That's ten. Jesus says, nice job. Well done, good and faithful, come on in. The next one says, you gave me two. I multiplied it, got two more, that's four. Jesus said, nice job, come on in, well done, good and faithful. But that one said, well, I only had one. I was afraid because I knew what kind of person you were. Well, you know, you just reap where you haven't sown and all that kind of stuff. I hid and buried my talent. Here it is, here's one. And you know, Jesus didn't say, well, you were faithful. He didn't say faithful. Well, I've heard a lot, well, you know, bless God, I'm a getting by. Jesus has not called us to get by. He has called us to multiply. He has called us to increase. The kingdom of God, you know, he said, there, uh, what about his kingdom? There shall be no end. He's of God of ever increasing might and dominion. And so I don't say that to scare anybody, but I want you to understand, ladies and gentlemen, he's the boss. We got 24 hours every day. We have an opportunity every day to spread love, to spread the, the gospel, and that opportunity every day to be faithful, to be fruitful, to grow to have a relationship with him, to, to be part of his family. Oh, my goodness, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and I recognize different people have different gifts, different people have different talents. And, and, and is it possible that some people were born into better circumstances than others? Yes. But I got bad news for you. You were born in America. <laughs> to whom much is given, much is required. Like Dr. Ben Carson said, I already hit the lottery. I was born in America. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, I know there's a lot of bad stuff going on. You still hit the lottery. You're in America. I mean, my goodness, what a privilege to live in this country. What a privilege. So we, 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 we've been given such a joyous privilege to, to be part of this kingdom and, and, and to be full of grace and, and, and the, 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 the Holy Spirit, and we've got the name of Jesus. And I mean, it's like we're the servant with five talents. I mean, think about how we rate compared to our Old Testament counterparts. They didn't have the Holy Spirit like we do. They did not have that infilling. 
Think of how we rate to, I mean, even uh, Elijah or Elisha, Moses, those were great men of God. But they were on the, back, the other side of Calvary. We're on this side of the cross. We've got the Holy Ghost. They didn't have the new, they didn't even have Philippians chapter 4. I can do all things through Christ. Who's I mean, what if Moses had Philippians chapter 4 when he was at the burning bush? Lord, I stutter, 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 but I can do, 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 do all things, do, do, things through Christ, Christ, Christ who says, make me, me, makes me stutter, stutter, stutter. I, I'm going to do it. I mean, how much more powerful would Moses have been with the Holy Ghost? With the New Testament. Amen. What needed to carry around them two ten tablets of stone everywhere he went, he had them written, but it had them written in his heart. Praise God. You know how much easier life would have been for him? People didn't have to go to the priest to get a word from God. They could have just went to write to Jesus for themselves. Well, I got stuck there for a while, but we need to hear that stuff. So the church needs to seek to do it God's way. Not our own way. I wrote down two statements. Love without truth. There are churches that just want to share the, the love of Jesus. We just, it's all about the love of Jesus. Well, yes, it is the love of Jesus. But what they do is good works without truth. And if, if, if we feed people and we clothe people, but we don't tell people about Jesus... All we're doing is delaying their suffering. Love without truth is empty. But if we give people truth without love and we beat them over the head with a Bible, that's brutality. So we have to have a combination of love and truth. We, we need to help people. We need to feed people. We need to clothe people. We, we need to do those wonderful compassion works. We need to be there for the hurting and the destitute and, and, and those things, that's what we're here for. But we can't just say, here's, here, here's some chicken, here, here's some, some wheat checks, go have a nice life. Folks, it, it, it's not that. It's, let me tell you something. You think you're hungry now. Wait till you haven't had a drink for 28,000 years. And you've been falling the whole time and you can't get up. And you're hearing screeches. And we, I say to the drug, drug, drug addicts now and the meth addicts right now, I love you and we want help for you, but you think you got it bad now. And if you think this life is so bad, you got to take drugs to escape, wait till you're in a pain of eternal torment and there are no drugs. Hallelujah. We, we, the Lord put us here for a reason. All right, we better move on. We have beat that dead horse. Number seven. He loves the church. Jesus loves the church. Hmm. You know, my wife, and she's not here so we can talk about her. She's over there somewhere. She doesn't like to fish. My, she doesn't like worms. She doesn't like minnows. She doesn't like fish hooks. Just doesn't like it. But she'll be out with me if I'm fishing for eight hours, which happens very rarely, but I sure would like it to happen more. She'll be with me all eight of those hours. And she does. You know when I say, "Honey, I want to go fishing," and she's like, "Go." I'm in the back of her mind, she might think, good, I can go on the Amazon.com. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know what? She loves what I love. Now, I have forbidden her to ever go golfing with me. <laughs> we, we tried that a few times. You know, I've seen couples out on the golf course and join, a, join that day together. That doesn't work for us. And it just doesn't, you know, I'm focused and I want the ball to go a certain place and when it doesn't go there I, she starts laughing <laughs> and, and then the more she tries to stop laughing she more she laughs and before you know it I'm like hey I'm trying to and now I can I get up to the ball <laughs> hit the ball and she just starts laughing <laughs> like no wonder I can't hit the ball but you know what 
She loves what I love. And she, she loves this thing. She likes, this, this, she likes going to these Goodwill and thrift stores and finding little treasures for things around the house. You know, milk glass. What, what in the world is your fascination with milk glass? I, there's never been a day in my life I woke up and said, boy, I'd like to have some milk glass around the house. But man, she started collecting milk glass, and well, praise God, honey, I'm glad. Here's your two dollars and seventy-five cents. So go get you some good, some. I guess it could be a lot worse, huh? She she could be collecting those high-dollar shoes. But we love each other, and we love the things that we love, and we want each other to enjoy what we love. And. The Lord loves the church. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Of course, we use that for marriage, and, and there's a lot of marriage teaching we can do there. We just had a marriage seminar, so I won't go too far into that. But Christ loves the church. He gave himself for her. He's been patient with our weaknesses. He's been more than merciful to us in our sin. He sends people alongside of us to encourage us and to help us. He's given us the Holy Spirit. If it's important to him, it ought to be important to us. If we want to have a relationship with someone, we need to share common interests. Dogs and cats. Cats. And dogs. Cats say, I, that person in my house, they feed me every day. They clean up after, my, after I go to the bathroom. They brush me. They pet me. I must be a god. The dog in the same house says, those people in my house, they feed me every day. They brush me. They clean up after me. They must be a god. And Sometimes we get that cat or dog mentality. I think we ought to understand. We ought to be dogs. The Lord has done so much for us. He, he, is, he has blessed us. He has given us Jesus. He's given us the blood. He's given us the name. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He's God. Amen. And I, I don't want to have the mentality of, of being like a cat. And here comes God and be like, <laughs> and Jesus is saying, why don't you come to my church and fellowship with me? And we're like, did it come out of a can? <laughs> and, and then sometimes, you know, and, and we're like this. And, and, and we're feeling like that prayer coming in and we, we act like we're going to come in and let, 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 you know, be petted a little bit, just be a little covered. And, 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 and then they go out to the, and, nah. You know, God, God's not called us to be cat-like Christians. He's called us to be dog-like Christians. When, 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 when the master is calling, man, <laughs> get that tail wagging, 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 wagging. You know, that's how we need to be. Jesus loves the church. If he loves it, we ought to love it. Let's be dogs in the church, not cats. Amen. Amen. That went over so well. Maybe you want some more canned food. <laughs> oh. Thought Friskies would do it this time, but I guess not. <laughs> oh my. Jesus loves the church. Seriously. We ought to love it. He gave himself for it. We ought to give ourselves for it. Number eight. Well, that's number eight. He gave himself for the church. His entire life. Left heaven for 33 and a half years. All right. I know we've all made sacrifices. We've all made sacrifices. Mardana, what do you have? 82 kids? <laughs> Five? Uh, did it ever feel like 82 kids? Yeah. yeah. Did you have to make sacrifices for your kids? Yeah, yeah you did. I'll tell you, yeah, that's what you do, right? We all have. We've all made sacrifices for our kids. We met, you know, we, we, we've done things to unselfishly for somebody. 
not just our kids, for our spouses, for our bosses, for people we don't even know. I'm sure we've all given to a panhandler here or there, and we've done some nice things for people unselfishly that required us to lay a little bit down of ourselves. But ain't none of us gave up heaven. I mean, when you read the depiction of heaven, I mean, all of heaven, all these angels and these awesome beings, 24 elders, and I mean, there's just gold everywhere and beautiful mansions and diamonds and gemstones and pearls. And, and it may, I mean, what we have here is nice, but it ain't that nice. And all of it revolved around Jesus. Wherever Jesus went in heaven, he was the celebrity. Jesus had the entourage. Jesus, you know, he didn't need to have a limousine. He just went. He just went at the speed of thought. And he left all that behind. To be born in a barn, laid in a food trough. Oh, that's disgusting. Wrapped in cheap swaddling clothes. Knowing in just a short lifetime later, the beard would be plucked out of his face. He, he, he sacrificed himself. He gave up him. And I know sometimes we all want to feel sorry for ourselves, don't we? Oh, Lord, <laughs> oh, we had these bills due, and I had to pay my tithe, and oh, it hurt a little. Oh, Lord, I was tired, and yet I went unto church. I only got 12 hours of sleep last night. <laughs> the term Christian means Christ-like one. We need to be imitators of Christ. Amen. Be a God imitator. And if God sent his only son, if Jesus gave himself for the church and we're imitating Jesus, then we ought to give ourselves to the church too. You know, uh, I have someone I went to Bible college with many years ago. And uh, not everybody who goes to Bible college stays in the faith. Just like, I mean, there are people, and you may know some, that at one time were devout Christians, and then they've done an about face, and now they're just, they've renounced their faith or serving the devil or whatever. And, and this particular person went that direction. And I still have some semblance of contact with them, a friend of mine. And they've been quoting all these famous preachers who were a famous preacher who left the faith. And one of the, the reasons, and this, this happened in our lifetime, a famous preacher who just had some doubts and walked away and they wrote this book on why church is this and Christians are bad and just all doubt and unbelief and one of our major points was that Christianity encourages people to live more for the next life than this one can I tell you something yes it does <laughs> yes it does Absolutely, because I, 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 look, we talked about algebra. You don't have to know algebra to know this. You got 95 years here, okay? Do the math, 95, okay? Now, 95 minus zero is 95. You got 95, good ones. And let's say, Vonda, you're going to be 105, all right? Vonda gets to be 105, 120. All right, I don't know if I got that much patience. I'll be ready to get rid of you at about 105. Right. Now, I know 95 sounds like a lot. But then I look at eternity. I can't even count the stars. Go take, next time you go down to the beach and lay before the sun and anoint yourself with oil. <laughs> Pick up one handful of sand, just one, and count the granules. You can't do it. 
eternity. Eternity. I, I'm smart enough. I mean, I, not, I, I took calculus in high school, and I, if it wasn't for cheating, I would have failed. I just, I just straight up tell you. I mean, I failed. I, I did every form of cheating you could do. All right, I have received forgiveness, and I'm confessing my sin before the brethren. But, I mean, I think my teacher knew I was doing it, and they knew that was the only hope I had. But I took calculus, and, and calculus, that you work with imaginary numbers, and you work with numbers like infinity. That's crazy. But then you realize the reason they can make a mathematic science around infinity and imaginary numbers, the only way they could make calculus exist and quantum physics exist is if there really is a God. That is the only way there was infinite, infinite numbers and imaginary numbers. Only way. And I'm smart enough to know infinity versus 95. Now, I've, I've learned a few things investing-wise the hard way. I was telling some of our staff this week, you know, about the power of investing while you're young. I thought, you know, Andrew and I, we invested when we were young, and we saved up. And then you have things happen, and, you know, you take out that investment to do this, that, or the other, and it sounded good at the time, but I can tell you this, if I would have left it in there, it would be worth a lot more today than that couch we bought. That couch is long and gone. Does anybody else know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And we learned the hard way a few times. Some of it was we were just poor, you know, church folk in the beginning of our ministry. And you have kids, you go through a building project, those type of things, but, uh, or two. But you know what? <laughs> I wouldn't trade it for the world. But I know this. I've learned a thing from investing is what you do today has a lot more power down the road. And when it comes time, ladies and gentlemen, for eternity, I, I, yeah, I am living for the next life because I can read and I can believe what I read when it's in the Bible. Amen. So I'll leave you with this and I'll let you go. The chicken and the pig. The chicken and the pig were having a conversation. They loved their farmer. They said, man, we have such a good farmer. We've got to do something really nice. And the pig says, how about we send them on vacation? The chicken says, well, we don't have any money. The pig says, how about we uh, wash his car? The chicken says, hey, we don't have any hands. Finally, the chicken says, I got an idea. Let's make him breakfast. The pig says, okay, what do you want to fix? The chicken says, how about ham and eggs? Pig says, I don't like that idea. The chicken says, why not? Well, you want to make a donation, but you want me to go all in. <laughs> and you know what? We, we got a lot of chickens in the body of Christ. They want to make a donation, but they want somebody else to go all in. Jesus went all in. Anyway, let's be an all-in Christian. Amen. Anyway, let's go all in, praise God. Look, you're, 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 you're in, you're, you, you know, it's kind of like, if, if, if you're out in the ocean and you're out to this deep, you might as well just dive in. You're, you're in plenty now, right? Just dive the rest of the way in. Once you, once you call on the name of Christ, they already label you a, a fanatic, lunatic, whatever you are. Just dive in. Go all in for the things of God. Amen. Well, I need to be done. But this usually takes one message. Now it's going to be two plus Man, I'm excited about the Word of God. We just, we just open it up and it just begins to flow in us, doesn't it? Praise God. The Word of God encourages and God. I didn't say this in the beginning. I usually don't on Wednesday nights, but I just need to tell you. There are some folks here. You're, you're saying, you know what? Maybe I need to make church a habit. Yes, give it a year. Watch what happens in a year. Watch what happens in a year. Watch what you won't recognize yourself. You like I didn't know I could, I'll, and, and and just I'll let you go. But I, I was talking to Jeffrey today. 
I said, Jeffrey, I am just so glad Jesus saved us. Where would we be? You know, and Goose, if, if you didn't know Erlene's husband, his name was Goose. And he, he was a riot. Um, and a uh, very successful businessman. And uh, just a personality you couldn't help but to love. He just made everybody feel like a winner. He was a salesman. But you know, Goose was a party animal. Big time. And he found Jesus toward the end of his life. And I'm so glad. But I looked and I thought, oh Lord. Because one of the reasons I like Goose so much is because if I wouldn't have found Jesus, I would have turned out just like him. And I liked to party when I was a kid. And had a lot of those same attributes. And I'm so thankful that Jesus kept me away from it. So I can be part of what he's called me to do. And I'll tell you some is every day in the ministry great? No. There are some bad days in the ministry. The day you lost Goose, yeah, that hurt. You know, the day we lost Steve and you feel, you know, when you lose a, a, a church member, you, you can't help but to feel like a failure. You know that? And it, the Lord rebuke, you know, get you out of it real quick. But, you know, oh, my goodness. There's bad days in the ministry. Sure. But I'll tell you what. Wouldn't trade it for nothing. And I hope you feel that way about your calling and where you are in the Lord. And be so thankful that the Lord saved you. And he's given you a purpose. And part of that purpose is to be part of his special body called the church. And so much more so than just the church here in Cloverdale. You've got brothers and sisters all over the world. Amen. So we need to let you go. Uh, May 9th, Mother's Day. I will be leaving for Pakistan after church that day. Uh, so I would ask for your prayers even now. Now, let's get this thing covered and uh, safety and protection, fruitfulness and effectiveness. And uh, one of the things, if you're ever praying for me when I'm on my trip, well, you might not think of this. One of the things you need to pray for me is your is stomachs. Of it, because when you're over there eating the third world food, it can, it can really put you on your butt. And so you've got to believe God for, for stomachs and digestion, safety and protection, ministry effectiveness. So believe in God, I, I, well, I gotta let you go, man. I, but I'm, I enjoy being here, don't you? Yeah. Amen. Well, we barely, did. Father, in the name of Jesus. Sometimes you just need to be smart enough to run. It's about closing number four. Just, just get up and leave, Father. We just ask you to bless this, uh, this pressful people. Lord, I, I want to just, as a body, lift up Erlene right now, and her family, her, and. Um, just ask for a special head, just a, a special mercy and grace as they grieve. And Lord, help us to really, as a church family, to surround her and to celebrate what Goose meant to us and to be there for her as she has been for us so many times. We ask you, Lord, as we go, that none of us would feel disconnected from the body, but we would feel such a lively part of the body of Christ. And all God's people said, amen. Hey, we're dismissed. I'll be up here. If anybody needs prayer, I'll be glad to pray for you.